David Morgan is an expert on silver, gold, and precious metals investments. He's a world-renowned lecturer appearing on CNBC and the Fox Business Channel. He's an author having penned Get the Skinny on Silver Investing. And Mr. Morgan is a regular contributor and friend of the Ellis Martin Report. David, welcome back to the program. Ellis, it's good to be back. I decided day before yesterday, actually, that the bottom was in. I made my own personal decision that the bottom was in with regard to silver, even though I've been watching a decline in gold and silver for quite Quite a long time. I'm at the place in Santa Monica. The name of the place is called Wilshire Coin. I'll give them a plug. And the young man behind the counter, by young, I mean he was probably in his late 20s, early 30s, very young compared to me. And he said to me, yeah, it's being manipulated. <laughs> I didn't expect that to come out of the mouth of a young dealer. He said that. And I thought, well, geez, is that really still true? Is that what's going on? And then I was listening to an interview you had done with the SGT report very recently. And that was the gist of that conversation. Basically, the gist of the what, what I understand from the interview is the manipulation is ongoing and nobody in power, whoever those folks are, want to see uh, any sort of value with regard to silver or gold. Uh, where do you stand on this today in November? Well, I've been pretty consistent. I mean, basically what I've said forever is that the long-term trend cannot be manipulated. And within the long-term trend, certainly it is. From time to time, I am not in the camp that, you know, every squiggle, every dollar move is kind of at their beck and call. I mean, when silver ran from 19 to 48, you know, how much manipulation was going on? I don't know, if any. Certainly, I do know when it's running hard, what they do is they stand aside and they wait for the market to exhaust. And then once the market is exhausted, which means it's like throwing a ball up in the air, it loses momentum and it actually gets to the apex, and then it reverses and comes the other direction. That's a pretty darn good analogy for what happens in any market, and especially one that's as small as the silver market. So the point is that, yes, these markets are all manipulated. And what I said in the recent interview was that if you can manipulate money, by definition, all markets are manipulated because everything stems from the currency supply and what the interest rate on the future value of that money is. So I think I'm consistent there. I don't like to play the manipulation card constantly because, to me, it shows sort of a weakness to know the underlying fundamentals and why you know everyone should have some and the idea that you don't have to take responsibility because you know if you buy it and it goes down, well they manipulated on me. Well, you gotta you know use your head and buy when you know it's undervalued. And as far as the sale goes, it's going to be something I think is going to be rather difficult for me when I make my call because there'll be such a fervor around the metals that anyone that even thinks of selling them will be <laughs> will might be despised at that moment in time. But I'll approach that when the time comes. So probably a long answer, but a uh, significant answer because most people, in fact, some that were in the camp of, you know, there's no manipulation or whatever, in the last few years have basically come into the camp that yes, these markets are manipulated and most in the camps that are, oh, this or that may be manipulated are now in a camp that almost all markets, if not all markets are manipulated. I mean, of course, this is provable for several aspects. One is the working group on financial markets and secondly, the LIBOR scandal, which is public knowledge in the public forums all over the place. And again, that goes back to my main point is if you can uh, manipulate the interest rates, you can manipulate anything because everything derives from that. Was this market manipulated up a few years ago, especially with regard to gold? We know that oil was probably manipulated up. And as much as we could debate whether oil's coupled to gold and silver or not, aren't we seeing sort of a natural drift down to where silver and gold should be? Well, that is a great question. I want to get into the semantics here. So it depends on how you define the word manipulation. I mean, when markets have momentum, there's lots of momentum players. In fact, most of the software programs that you buy, and some are rather inexpensive and some are ex still extremely expensive, are basically momentum programs. So what you had on the way up was you had a lot of hedge funds that had a lot of cash that said, oh, look at that thing move. It's moving. I'm on board. And that makes it move even more for a while. And so more people and funds move in. And so was that manipulation? Mm. So who's the other side? The other side are the commercials and they take the short side and they get all the data. I mean, most people these days can get a lot of data. And so what you look at is how much volume is coming in because all movement in markets, especially if they're free markets, move based on the amount of volume. 
how much is wanted. If a little bit's wanted, then a big move is unwarranted. But if a lot is wanted, a lot of buying pressure, that means the market's going to move up. A lot of selling pressure, that means the market will move down. So they see it, and so they'll take some rather what I call schoolboy positions on the way up. But they pretty much stand aside because why? Because they know what they're doing. So was it manipulated in a way? Mm, I would say not so much that it was manipulated as it was a momentum play, very similar to the oil market. And then again, as I said earlier, it exhausts. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the volume to decrease, 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 decrease. And when all buyers are in, it's an easy short, very easy short, as long as you know that the market's exhausted. In other words, there's no volume left anymore. So that's what they did. They, meaning the commercials or the bullion banks or a combination thereof. They looked at that, and you see it in a smaller way too. I mean, on days where the market's you know more volatile, you will see them, them meaning the commercials, step aside and not put on many contracts until it's what I call let it run. And they'll let the market run. They'll let all the buyers in. There has to be some sellers on the other side. There are, but they don't really start massively selling until it's to their advantage. So once the run has been made and the volume decreases substantially and there aren't many buyers left, then they will start to short. And for every seller, there has to be a buyer and vice versa, which is the big argument. And that's true. But what they have to do is match orders. And this is what these commercials are phenomenally good at is matching orders. So let's say we're at the top, let's say it's $48 silver back in the last day of April 2011, and you want to sell 10,000 contracts. Those orders have to match. But there's no one out there in the world that wants to buy at 48 as an example. So what happens? Well, there's 10,000 for sale. Somehow they got to match, and the exchange will match them. And I'll match those sales with open orders, which are market orders. So then someone said, well, you know, I missed silver at on the way up to 48, but I think 40 is a good buy. So I, I want 100 contracts at 40 as an example. So that sell matches at 40 and it clears. And now you got 100 sales at 40. And there's a gap between the $48 price and the $40 price. Now, that is not what happened. I do this for example and illustration purposes only, but that's how gaps are developed in the chart. And once the downward pressure starts, as I just outlined, it'll go really hard and really fast. And these guys then are absolutely in control and they'll just keep selling more and more and more. And of course, they've already sold some on the way up and they'll just push it down and down and down. So it's pretty evident from anybody that looks at the data and knows what they're looking at that the most of the let's say activity that has been directed to control the level of price movement has mostly been on the downside or the short side but i have to say in all fairness that on the way up there were a whole lot of momentum players that were jumping on board because it was moving so strongly up and the powers that be or the ones that know the most or control the most were letting it do its thing. I mean it's like stepping in front of a freight train. When do you step in front of a freight train? When it's going 100 kilometers an hour or when it's coming in the depot and it's about ready to roll to rest? Well then it's pretty safe to step in front of it. I think I try to make it very clear so everyone can understand it because it's important to understand. I mean there's a lot of people that base it all on emotion. Oh they manipulated or they didn't or they don't or they will or they David doesn't, you know, all that stuff. And I, I don't have time for it, really. But that's how it works. And that's how it's been working. And it's been working in their favor for quite some time. And one more thing, even though I belabored the point, Ellis, and that is the psychology. And that's something that no one really talks about. I did a interview all about the psychology of the markets with my friend Sherry Wilcox two years ago. And it actually caught quite a bit of attention on the Internet for a while. Because this is when the market fundamentally kind of gives up and that was at the $26 silver level on the $15, $50 gold level and those massive sales that no one in their right mind would sell that much at one time unless they wanted one thing to happen and well two things to happen one they wanted the price to get crushed for both the metals and they wanted the psychology to change from somewhat bullish to fairly bullish to bullish to oh my goodness I wish I never even heard of the precious metal and they accomplished that both of those things they crushed the metals downward, both gold and silver, and more importantly, they crushed the psychology of the market that bullish people turned bearish. People that were waiting to buy decided not to, and uh, a lot went on at that juncture. 
I ought to be able to answer this question, but I'm asking you, and maybe you could be more objective and put some analysis into the answer. Why do people like me, who are very conservative with regard to investing and even with physical metal, and you're always telling your subscribers, people like me, to accumulate physical metal, why do people like me just decide yesterday or the day before to, that this is probably the bottom or maybe a dollar or two away from the bottom? Now's a good time to accumulate. What's the psychology behind that? Well, I can't speak for you. I mean, that's the whole <laughs> point, really. It's an individual case-by-case -case basis. I mean, there are people that are willing, very patient, and they've got an objective, and they may not have an exact price point, but they all of a sudden realize, or not even say all of a sudden, they've been watching the market for a long time, and they realize, you know, I it's bounced off this level. Maybe they don't know that consciously, but subconsciously. We certainly have bounced off the uh, 1417, 1411. I think the last print a couple of days ago was around the 1420 level. So right now, as we're doing your show, Ellis, uh, we have a triple bottom. Does that mean that it is a triple bottom? No. Because I need to see more data, we've only come off that bottom for like a day or a day and a half, and we're early in this session right now. But that could be it. Certainly looks like it is. And the other part of it is fundamentally you're buying it at price cheaper than almost any mine on the planet can mine it for, except save one that I know of. And so you're buying it at a very, very valuable, value-based price, meaning you're buying it for uh, what most silver miners can't manufactured at. So it's a great buy, especially if you do it in a manner that's, you know, it's not your life savings. You're not betting the farm. You're not putting everything that you own into the silver or gold market. You're taking an approach and you probably have the idea that maybe if it goes lower, you could buy some more. I don't know, but a lot of people do that. So, but it's a case by case, individual by individual basis. That's what makes a market. And that's why markets cannot be predicted 100% of the time. Markets can be predicted fairly accurately for a great percentage of the time, but people are people and they are unpredictable all of the time. And that's why you have things like the long-term capital management blow up because their math model was there are predictabilities that would get within certain ranges. And when they're off so many sigmas, when I'm not trying to impress anybody, it's just say a Greek letter that means how far out of the normal range something is, were so extreme that it was impossible for that to go on, but it did. And that's because human behavior cannot be predicted all the time. And because of that fact, you have to be very careful in any market. So could the markets go much lower? Sure, they could. The other part of it is that with silver around the $14 level, the premiums are still up somewhat, not as high as they were a month or two ago when we were having a retail shortage, but they're still up there fairly decent. And if silver were to drop to say 12 as a quick thought experiment, you would probably see the premium come back in the market rather aggressively, which means this. You can buy silver today at say 14 and change and pay 15 to get it. If silver were to drop to 12, you'd probably still be paying somewhere around 15 to get it, even though the paper price has dropped $2. And I'm doing that again as a thought experiment or as an example to let people know the realities of the physical market versus the paper paradigm. If you wanted to buy silver at 12 and you had a futures account ready to go and you could pull the trigger either on your computer or call your broker and establish a position at that point in time, then certainly you could take delivery on $12 silver, which would end up costing you somewhere around, I don't know, twelve thirty-five or so. Because no one buys at spot as the full price. You can lock in the spot price, but then even if you're buying raw silver, which means commercial bars, what you actually get is some more paperwork. You've got to fill out some paperwork for the exchange that costs money. You've got to do this transfer thing that costs money. And then you've got to transport it to your house, which costs money. So by the time you get those bars in your hand, you have paid spot plus some amount in order to do the paperwork and the transportation costs that are involved. So when you trade at spot back and forth and back and forth, all you're doing is you're trading derivatives. You're not trading physical metal. If you're trading physical metal, there's an added cost to it. I decided when I accumulated some silver this week, I decided that I was willing to average down. So believing that there was a bottom, but yet knowing that more downside was probable, I decided that I will make some future purchases should the price drop. That's probably not a bad philosophy. 
absolutely. I've been a subscriber of yours for quite a long time. I would say six or seven years right now. We're going up to the Silver Summit. We're both going to be there. What are you going to be telling fellow subscribers, possible new subscribers about the state of the market right now with regard to silver and, and junior mining companies and also what's new? Well, I'm going to speak about silver in the 21st century, so I'm going to take kind of a longer view on it, looking at, of course, the monetary aspect and, of course, the industrial aspect. There's a little commotion around the solar industry because there is a company that's come out named NatCore that is using aluminum for solar panels. We interviewed the CEO extensively, we meaning Chris Marchese and myself. We were at the New Orleans Gold Show. I think it's possible that it could be a disruptive technology, but I don't think it's going to be disruptive for years. Years from now, and it's not because I'm super bullish on silver, it's because I'm objective as I can possibly be. So there's a lot to look at in the silver market. And of course, the main thing that is way bigger than silver is what is the context for the global economy and what is the context for the global financial markets because there's been a huge disconnect between the financial markets and the real economy. And because of that fact, people need to really be reassured about what the truth is and how they can position themselves, not only financially, because it's bigger than money, for what is actually taking place in the real world. And this is something that you're not going to get from the mainstream financial press or from the mainstream media. And that's why people that write in the alternative media, write newsletters or, or do things such as myself and many others, it's very important if you're awake because you want to really get through that cloud, let's say, and really see what's happening so you can actually anticipate the future with some degree of assuredness that it's going to be such and such rather than what the pictures painted on the mainstream press. In the past, we discussed a uh, mobile mill company that you're a shareholder in. I'm curious as to any updates, anything new with regard to that company. Well, as you know, as a member of the Morgan Report, we finally were able to produce the uh, first initial report. It was yesterday. It was a long time coming. Uh, We had the whole report done and all the videos done. Our premium members get to watch the videos that we do on these site tours. And this one's actually quite extensive, probably more than some that we do. And those will be uploaded for any members that are listening to this. They will be uploaded here shortly. But we had the report done, and just before we were going to issue the report, in fact, ahead of schedule, we were giving information from the company that there was going to be a restructuring of the whole situation. And so that made it where our hands were absolutely tied, could not say anything, and had to wait for a public announcement to be made before we were allowed to say anything by law. So obviously we adhered to that. We didn't want any of our members to get in trouble, nor of course ourselves. And so we just stuck to our guns and know what the facts are. And we had no inside information. In fact, I didn't know the details until it was public information, which is how it should be. Sometimes these companies will kind of whisper to an analyst or a newsletter writer or something that really they be better off if they don't. But it happens. It's happened with me and I just keep my mouth shut because it's basically inside our information. And so you really are restricted to the law, which is a level playing field. Ha ha. I say that ha ha because we see some of the, let's say, other entities not participating with that, but I do. So until it's public information or publicly disclosed, I just wait. And once that's established, then, of course, we move onward. So right now, it's a preliminary, not exchange approved, but that doesn't change the technology. And so we put out the report on the technology. Of course, we gave the particulars from the news release that is public domain information for everybody to go ahead and check out. And once this exchange approves, this transaction, which I expect that they will, then we'll probably make a tip our hat and say we suggest this as a speculative situation. So hopefully I didn't talk around that too much. Still (laughs) exciting. I really like it. I like the people involved. I actually like the restructuring. I think it's going to be very beneficial to shareholders longer term. But, you know, I can't say a whole lot because it's not a done deal yet. You know, it's sort of like a ball game kind of situation. We're in the third quarter and the fourth quarter need to be played, so we don't know the outcome yet. So we're talking essentially for the listeners that have not heard us discuss this before, we're talking about a company that has mobile mills that you can bring to a mine site, alleviating the uh, junior mining company of the expense of having to build a mill so they have access to actually process, whether it be mineral rich tailings or whether it be assets near the service, process uh, that right away and generate some income into the company's coffers. 
Uh, yeah, well said. Well said. I'll add on to it. Basically, it's gravity feed gold, and if you can crush it at the beginning and stick in the hopper of this mobile mill, you basically get gold at the other end, and then it's on a shared basis with this company that we're so high on and the uh, company itself. The big thing are uh, two things. One is it's non-dilutive to the shareholders. So if you have mining company ABC and the ABC company has gravity feed gold, it's a good way for them to finance without diluting the shareholders. It really changes the junior mining industry. And I want to emphasize we're junior mining industry for those that do have gravity feed gold primarily. You could do with other things, but gold so high dollar worth per unit volume that gold is the best way to go. And so there are many of those out there, and some of these are in locations that water is the huge issue. And since this system contains its own water and loses very little, you might be able to start processing at a pretty good mill uh, flow-through rate and only see a water truck come in, let's say, on a weekly basis type of thing. So it is exciting, but it's not real well proven. We go through that in our report. We're about as you know straight up as they come i mean we're going to let you know the facts and the facts are this thing is not run seven days a week for two months straight not saying it's designed to do that but it's designed to mill so that would be let's just say conservatively uh, 10 hour days five days a week again and again and again and it hasn't had those kind of hours put on it so i'm convinced the technology works what I'm not convinced of is whether or not this thing is durable enough at this point in time to, you know, continuously operate. But those challenges can be overcome. I mean, that's part of the learning process. And maybe it can. I don't know. I'm just trying to be honest here. So it's a really interesting speculation. I really like it. I think it's worth some bet a little to win a lot. I think it certainly could be that type of a situation. These are the kind of speculations that we seek out. We've known about this for years and finally, a little bit of load off my shoulders that we're able to get the preliminary report out. And of course, once this deal is completed, then we will do follow-up reports for our members only and continue to update it as this situation continues to progress. And how does one become a subscriber of the Morgan Report if they're not already? There's a couple of ways. One, you can just call our office, 480-325-0230. That's 480-325-0230. Just phone in. Our staff can take the uh, credit card information over the phone. All the prices are on the website. But basically, if you want the premium service where you get all the videos and the basic reports and uh, everything that we do that we film throughout the year and all the updates that I do on the trades that I'm making, explaining the charts and the commodities, etc. That's roughly 300 a year. I think if you pay in advance, you get a pretty good discount if you pay every six months. So I think it's exactly 300 a year. Those type of services are usually 5,000 a year. Silver's the people's metal. So I've always been kind of on the under promise and over deliver. It's kind of my motto, really. So that's that. You know, you can call in or you can just go to the website. If you want to put your uh, information through the uh, system on the website, you can do that as well. Well, David, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, and I'll see you in San Francisco at the Silver Summit. Thanks for joining me today. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. I've been speaking with the silver guru, David Morgan. His website is themorganreport.com. Listen to the segment again on the homepage of our website, ellismartreport.com, or download the entire Ellis Martin Report on iTunes.